Receive this tape. Most of you, I'm sure, the Christmas holidays will be over, and uh, you'll be ready to celebrate the coming of 1980, the 1980s. Of course, I wish all of you a happy New Year. If you can make it happy, make each day happy, you're lucky. Uh, don't look too far ahead this year, but take each day and grab what you can and make the most of it. The 1980s are going to be very interesting. I guess that is one of the words that I prefer to use at this time. Tom Wolfe, the author who recently did a book on the astronauts, was on the Today Show uh, talking about the 1980s with Tom Brokaw, and the trouble with our society, I believe, was epitomizing the kind of dialogue they were having. Wolf was lauding several things that would be happening in the 80s. He talked about the astronauts and the need for heroes and that how much the uh, moon trip meant to us at the time they did it because of our intense hatred of the Soviet Union and antagonism towards the Soviet Union and that we looked upon the uh, space project as... Uh, and our answer to Sputnik, and we used these men as heroes. Uh, Tom Wolfe also talked about the return of aristocracy. That's why he called it the royal decade, the emergence of the royal class and the distinctions between classes. And then he talked about the need of more religion in the White House. Well, of course, these are the very things that have brought this decade or this era falling flat on its face all over the world. One is that we don't need uh, heroes such as the moon shot because the astronauts later went into large corporations and dissolved themselves into various places with their mental sicknesses, their divorces, their emotional problems, and the possible fakery even of the moonshot that they didn't even go there. The lying and the deceptions of the entire uh, era have been so gross and blatant, and we're paying the price now for all of that. We didn't need those kind of heroes, I don't believe. We don't need the aristocracy or the royal color that he's talking about. That's what these world revolutions are about, the front page uh, headlines, the hatred of the United States of America, the wider gap between the rich and poor, the rising awareness of the lower middle class, and uh, the response of those people towards the rulers or the ruling class is not what we need, and I don't see how he thinks that we're going to install this royal purple era of aristocracy when they're falling flat on their faces. Uh, we don't need religion in the White House. We don't need religion anywhere. Religion, for the most part, and I do believe in God, which is separate from these formal religions, um, is a total fraud. The commandment, thou shalt not kill, is ignored, and the people doing the most budgets for defense, the most uh, warmongering personalities are also incidentally, the most religious and attend church every Sunday, and there's this terrible contradiction of religion and weapons, and goodness knows uh, we don't need the preacher in the White House, and Tom Wolf was saying we need social classes that terms like redneck or plaid skirts referring to middle-class children in private schools and so forth would come out. I think it's the other way around. I think the secrecies are being broken open and the embassies being broken into and the papers can be read by everybody. We can't shred fast enough or lock up fast enough for the way things can be burned down or torn down. We don't need uh, royalty or the royal purple or the ruling class and we don't need more religion. I believe the 1980s is going to be a period of tremendous despair. I think we've done very little with our education and have learned not much since World War I or II. Uh, this is going to be the uh, further rising of the have-nots, referred to always as the third world, the guerrillas, the terrorists. Um, I don't like any of those terms. Uh, they're waking up. <laughs> they're catching on. Uh, the seams are falling apart in imperialism and fascism. I'll go through some of those heads of states that fell in the 70s. Uh, the seams are falling apart in the British royal uh, ruling class and the infiltration of spies and exposés and books of prominent people and their various kinky sex patterns and uh, servants write books. The walls have ears and the tables are being turned. The media sells juicy stories about all kinds of relationships of famous people that had secrecy before. I can see a confrontation, a continuation of the warring period that's gone on, never ended, and the Vietnam experiment has been moved to the Middle East. 
Maybe it'll take 100 million people in the next 10 years that will be killed before a new generation wakes up. But so long as the newspaper, the television, and radio is controlled by the select few that represent the ruling class, if you don't have alternative press, alternative radio, uh, the, each new generation will go on making the same mistakes because the old generation hasn't sat back and analyzed their mistakes. They want to make the same ones over and over again. Um, we'll go into the mistakes in Iran, what's happening. Um, they can't sit back and analyze the errors of the past, and we just keep repeating them continuously, and I don't see any end to the cycle until some new minds or some new advisors come in and say, you're doing it the wrong way. I've been wanting to leave the country for the past 10 years, but circumstances have always come in that have forced me to stay here. And all this time I've been ashamed of what the United States has done. And when the embassies are burned and the demonstrations take place and headlines are against the United States and the major countries are afraid to stand by us, um, I am embarrassed by the dictatorships we've put in, the torture instruments we've had, the manipulations of the courts, the murdering of labor leaders, musicians, uh, politicians, candidates, the president, heads of states of other countries, this country has been a total disaster in terms of moral responsibility, uh, the reporting of the news media, the court system. It is a disgrace, and to live with it is to be a part of the breaking of the seams, the awareness of the people, the, how they've been ripped off, and to suffer the consequences of a lot of the things that have gone on. I've never liked it. I've never approved of it. That's why I've been on the radio and doing the research to expose the many ways that this country has been fouled up. Uh, the air, the food, the minerals, the chemicals, the uh, manufacturers, everything is cheap and vulgar, and there isn't it beauty in natural things around us, in natural life, in nature, and you have to find it, and you have to fight hard to hold it and fight hard to keep your sanity and reject the cheap and the vulgar and the uh, bad products in this country and the poisons in this country, poisons of body and mind. You have to be ever alert, working every day at twice the speed that you did the year before to avoid the pitfalls and the generalities and the cheapness and the avoidance of responsibility that people have in this country for the way their public officials act and respond. There's just too much news each week to cover in these tapes to do the kind of job I would like to do. It used to be that I could get on KLRB for an hour a week or 45 minutes and um, cover some of the major story, stories that I thought were important. And those of you who have the radio show tapes going back, this is eight years now, or the cassette tapes going back the last couple of years or take them continuously, can take certain names as I update them through this next year and rush through these names you have that advantage. Other people just will not be familiar with them because there's too much news coming out every week. It's uh, the comparison between seeing a Norman Rockwell painting where you get a visual image of a particular statement, a single statement that you could do in the past when times were slower, and now the radio tapes and the research is more like Jackson Pollock. You're going to have to take the drips of the paintings, mostly brown and black with a little bit of white and a lot of red for blood, and take it and get the total picture from the drippings. And uh, that's the way these tapes will be. Escalating through the year, I can see the way the news is going and my desk is accumulated. We're into what is like a pointillism or an abstract, a modern abstract of pieces that will give you a picture if you want to see it. And if you like what you see or hear, then order the back tapes if you don't have them to complete your picture. Several weeks ago, I ran down a list of important people from a historical part of point of view uh, who died in the 1970s who affected our lives in many ways, such as Charles de Gaulle and Aristotle Onassis and Howard Hughes and so forth. And then alongside that list, I gave a, a suggestion of nine or ten names of people that I wouldn't mind seeing disappear as soon as possible in 1980. That wasn't very nice to suggest a possible hit list. I only believe that if those ten people were dead tomorrow, it may save the lives of 100 million people within the next 10 years. That They're hell-bent on war of any kind, and it would be no loss. It would be, if I were alive in Germany in 1932 before the election of Adolf Hitler, 
the time of the Reichstag fire and was able to say to investigate the Reichstag, I might have said, uh, let's see what Mr. Himmler's doing. And Adolf Hitler and Mr. Reinhard Heydrich, Martin Bormann, Adolf Eichmann, Joseph Mengele's, Hermann Goering, Joseph Goebbels, Rudolf Hess. Uh, let's see what these guys are doing. And if we got rid of those nine, what would we have in terms of a war um, and the persecutions and the displacement of people and the loss of 80 million people and the way they died and the insanity of uh, torture and experimentation that continued uh, as soon as the overt war was over, the Cold War began immediately. Um, I know it's a mistake to get on the air to give the names of public enemies. It's uh, somebody felt that wrote to me that it could be dangerous and nonproductive. I also do it for another reason. I use these tapes sometimes as a sounding board for a response because when you mail out, you don't know where they're going or who they're going to. And very often after I do a tape, you'll see a response in the news like a cause and effect relationship. And I don't know how it's coming down or if it's coincidental. But right after I made that tape naming this particular list of people that we could do without, um, about 10 days later, I got a phone call just two days ago from a woman talking long distance. I knew she was from long distance. And we talked quite a while. Money didn't seem to be the problem. And after 30 minutes, uh, she said that she was from St. Louis and, and she was in Missouri. And she asked me, she said her parents were anarchists in the old country in Europe. And she was kidnapped and brought to this country and was raised by anarchists and that uh, she was with two different families and that she had been separated by them and kidnapped by the FBI. And they had her and she wanted to get away from the FBI because she just hated the FBI terribly. She read my article, the SLA is the CIA, and she knew that I was the only person that could get her in touch with Marxists or Leninists or anarchists. And I talked to her quite a while because I... Uh, know that when I sent to the FBI for Freedom of Information Act, my articles in The Realist and other ones from Playgirl and we were in there, and they sent me copies of my own article, so that these are available to the FBI and the intelligence community. But this woman kept saying, well, don't you know, can you get me back to my family? They've gone underground, and I want to be with the Marxists. I said, I don't know any Marxists. I want to be with the Leninists. You know, can you get me? And the thing is that I talked to her for a long time and realized that these people wanted to know what were, who I was working with or did I have a group or an organization. They like to keep track. And I, this call and I got the conversation going with her gave me the link of knowing that they said, well, what is Mae Russell up to? Does she have a hit list like uh, the people in Iran for going after the Shah's family, his nephew being killed and contracts out or so forth? It's a sounding board and it sounds a little bit dangerous for Mae Brussel to be on the air saying these renowned people would be better off dead. I really mean they would be better off dead, but I don't know anybody who's going to do the job, and I'm not inciting anybody to do it because I doubt if there are that many people out there that even can see now. They'll see it 20 or 30 years from now and wish maybe they had done it, but right now they can't see how individuals affect the course of history. And that is very important because individuals do affect history for better or for worse. And some of these people are polluting the earth terribly with their technology, their know-how, their ability to organize and mobile around the forces of hate and envy and greed and accumulate the kind of power that creates weapons and chemicals to destroy all the decent people that are minding their own business and doing the things that they like to do. Many of you know about the male harassment I've had from time to time. This last month, I got two checks back from my uh, Bank of America account, and one was torn, ripped off the corner in a very funny, curved fashion, just obviously mutilated and torn. And the other one that was made out to the post office uh, for $25 was burnt. One third of it, the corner, was burnt. And I know the postal workers don't smoke cigarettes while they're handling the mail. And usually at the bank, they're not sitting there smoking. So I sent a letter to the Beverly Hills branch of the Bank of America and enclosed my checks and asked the reason that they were in this condition. And other checks in that same batch were very badly mutilated as if they'd been carried around in a pocket for a long time. And one was just addressed to a farm center right down below the house a mile away, you know, for some clothing. So it couldn't have been carried that far. 
And I got a letter back uh, December the 11th from Bank of America saying, we apologize for your mu the mutilated condition of your two checks. Check 220 was torn somewhere in transit from the endorsing branch to us, and check 210 was burned because of a malfunction in the bank messenger's car. The problem has been attended to. I guess the car was fixed. Once again, we're sorry. We'll do our best to return your checks in good condition. So somebody is carrying around uh, or going through my checks to see who I'm paying or who I'm writing to, and uh, some are burned and some are mutilated. They're not very careful about the, the espionage they're doing, or else the workers are certainly uh, more, uh, they're not as trained as they used to be. They're more careless, or else they don't care. But I do send out um, trial balloons sometimes, and some, I appreciate your concern about me or my safety, and always write if you have any doubt or suggestions. But a lot of times I do these things for a reason, and uh, get the response back that I expect we'll be following. David Rockefeller is stepping down as chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, January the 1st, head of the nation's third largest bank, but certainly one of the most famous banks. It, recently it's been the center of a controversy. Uh, the Rockefeller family was responsible for sending the doctors down to the Shah of Iran of the medical treatment of bringing him to the United States. Chase Manhattan has been the principal bank for the Pahlavi family for their billions of dollars that were intertwined also with the Rockefeller oil money in Iran. Uh, David Rockefeller began his first job at the bank in the foreign department of Chase National Bank in 1946. The Rockefellers had a big role in uh, arming Adolf Hitler as our great bulwark against communism, and then when the war was over, they were in the thick of rebuilding Germany and putting the Nazis back into power and setting the stage for this new fiasco that will take place in the Middle East, probably right there, World War III. As head of the Chase Manhattan Bank, um, David Rockefeller didn't help the bank bring the Shah in. It was just one personal commitment that made Boomerang if the money could be drawn out of there, and I've talked about that on other tapes. There was a, a cartoon by Mike Peters in the Dayton Daily News this last week, and it's got a picture of the Shah of Iran passing a cup, and it says he's sick, homeless, and unloved, abandoned by his friends, afraid to show his face, let him know there's someone who cares, someone who wants to help him. He doesn't need much, a chauffeur, a cook, a gardener, the bare necessities, please help, adopt a Shah. And then it's got a space up above, adopt a Shah. Yes, I would like to adopt a Shah, it's like little squares. I'd like to make a contribution towards an island retreat, a villa, a yacht. And you put your name and your address and your Swiss bank account number. And it said, for more information, write to Henry Kissinger, Chase Manhattan Bank, New York, New York, 10022. So the, the Chase and the Shaw and Kissinger, um, that combine, we haven't heard the rest of that. Um, There's an article in the New York Times just last week behind the Chase's new vigor David Rockefeller, chairman of Chase Manhattan. Now, they were lauding him as um, being an important person on the board and his prestige at the institution. If he intended to step down January the 1st, the New York Times had no inkling of it, the man behind the Chase Bank. But I think that December 9th article, uh, long article on the strength of the bank and the strength of David Rockefeller, but there's been a big turn in the last few weeks, and I think Chase would be very nervous about the investments that the Shaw has in their bank. Walter Scott answered a question somebody wrote in the Sanse Mercury in the Washington Post, also carried it. There was a question about Henry Kissinger involved in an affair known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. What are the Dead Key Scrolls, <laughs> that this person asked? And the answer was when Kissinger was Secretary of State, he had a dead key attached to his phone, a button of sorts that permitted his secretary to monitor and transcribe phone calls without the other party knowing what was going on. Those transcripts are called the dead key scrolls. Several weeks before he left the Ford administration, K Kissinger had the notes moved to the home and New York estate of the late Nelson Rockefeller, Kissinger's patron. Kissinger subsequently no donated the notes to the Library of Congress on the condition that nobody can see them for 25 years, they're not subject to the Freedom of Information Act and so forth. So that here is a public servant as the Secretary of State 
who was transcribing everybody's conversations, who's left them on a private estate of the late Nelson Rockefeller. And again, the Chase, Manhattan, Standard Oil, Secretary of State, uh, whatever he was doing as a public servant under salary to us, he could blackmail every head of state in every country or try to and put them in the hands of the Rockefeller family. Kissinger was under the salary uh, to Rockefeller before he became Secretary of State. He married his wife at the height of Watergate when she was a full-time employee to the Rockefellers, and when he was out of government service, he was paid by the Rockefellers. And while he was Secretary of the State, he could transcribe all his information, goodness knows who he was talking to, and turn it over to the personal family of the Rockefellers. So that's enough blackmail to last a 1,000 years. I'm sure 25 years from now, what comes out will be very edited to make Henry Kissinger look good, and the juicy parts, such as J. Edgar Hoover used to take from people, will remain as control for the Rockefeller family and their investments wherever they go. Last Friday, when I made the tape saying that I believed that the Shah was under house arrest at the Army base, there were newspaper articles. One, Shah's health worsens. Another, physician tending Shah believes his condition is worse. Another article about the Shah's health may be worse. His attorney says in court, why did he leave so fast? That Friday he was very sick, and then all of a sudden he was flown out, and as I say, he was under house arrest. He ends up with Torrijos in Panama and is moved tighter into what I referred to as a uh, locked-up condition of the drug connection, the links of Jimmy Carter to Robert Vesco, and the narcotics traffic, that there's more to the Shahs being moved out of office and being sequestered than has yet surfaced and may never surface. But I'm sure the way journalists are going today that they will delve into this shortly. One of the reasons he left town so fast was that there was a lawsuit at, that at Lackland Air Force Base, he was going to be served with papers to appear. It had to do with an organization, the Bell Helicopter Company, a $6 million lawsuit uh, their international company that was filed, and the Shah's attorneys wanted to quash the subpoena. They were going to make the former monarch give a deposition in the $6 million lawsuit, and he was to be served at Lackland Air Force Base. Well, Bell Helicopter is owned by Mr. Miller, head of our Treasury, Secretary of the Treasury now, and two of those hostages that are going to be tried for spies if we don't declare World War III to avoid the spy trial in Iran are employees of Bell Helicopter, which is nothing but a spy agency from A to Z. Two of the employees of the Secretary of the Treasury are over among those 50 uh, members of the embassy or that were swept up as spies when the embassy was taken. Now, this suit was filed in 1976. There were 69 former pilots who said they were fired because they organized a union at Bell Helicopter International uh, to get terms of a contract. They were training Iranian military pilots, but they wanted to belong uh, American style to a union, and the Shah didn't want it. James W. Lane, attorney for the pilots, said he subpoenaed the Shah to get him to tell what he knew about the labor dispute, which took place in Iran. Then Rockefeller's lawyers swept into town, and the law Shah's lawyers said that giving the deposition, in quotes, would disrupt his recovery from prior therapy and make extremely serious threat to his health. Well, very often people get a sickness when they're subpoenaed for a trial, and the Shah uh, got sick, and the doctors came, and they flew him out of town, but they flew him to a very safe place, the safe place, of course, being in the arms of Trujillo with his notorious links to Richard Nixon and Hunt and Liddy and Operation Intercept and Robert Vesco and the world narcotics traffic and counterintelligence. So even though the shot is photographed uh, at the bar, this morning's paper, yesterday's paper had a picture of him looking suntanned and happy and so forth, he went out of the country into the arms of Trujillo, which is just the same as a military base, but right in the arms of his narcotics uh, traffic companions, so that that poor health was the Rockefeller doctor that flew out, and they got him quickly over to Panama. Uh, Robert Vesco is an interesting character. I did a little bit about him last week. Uh, Vesco had been charged with mafia connections and trafficking and illegal drugs, and he was wanted in this country because he stole $224 million from investment overseas. Um, but he has not been brought back. And I briefly mentioned last week the 
Carter connections to Capricorn records, just briefly, and the narcotic connections in Georgia, and the Billy uh, Carter connections to Robert Vesco. And um, there's a whole can of worms of narcotics traffic that's taking place now. Uh, it's been going on continuously, and it's probably the biggest business, bigger than the defense industry or even oil or uh, ammunition. It's, it, the narcotics traffic profits and the flow of narcotics is never properly identified with the heads of states and how they move. There was an article just this last week, French Connection is out, the Mideast drug traffic is in. And it goes on to say that the Middle Eastern Connection, using laboratories in Turkey and opium from Iran, is being processed, and the Southeast Asian narcotic traffic is slowing down. Um, the one that we escalated the war for, the heroin traffic, and now Europe is getting... 90% of its narcotics from the Middle East. There's a comparison between Turkish and Iranian opium and their morphine base and so forth and the Mediterranean laboratories, uh, the flow of the Turkish traffic. And now this article in the LA Times says the important thing is that the Turkish traffickers have their own laboratories. They're cutting out the middlemen and making it extremely difficult for remnants of the French connection to find morphine base. Iran it can produce its own heroin. A number of Iranians have been arrested in the United States and London, and most of the opium that enters the Middle Eastern connection is from Pakistan, Afghanistan. But this crop is pouring in. So if you squeeze out the middleman, you squeeze out the Marseille connection, a lot of people get hurt. And I believe that the flow of traffic of narcotics into the Hague and Holland, West Germany, France, Italy, and Austria is being affected at a level it would be uh, you could do a whole year's study on just the current flow of the narcotics, but I believe that one of the reasons for removing the Shah and his family from power in Iran has a lot to do with the flow of opium and heroin as much as any other reason, because the Savak could have protected him if the President of the United States Carter had wanted to, but by easing uh, the Shah out, the flow of traffic goes into different hands. Another article uh, this last week, Mexico drug use on the rise. Another one, West Germany struggles with narcotics. The narcotic problem is terrific. Who owns the flow of it is a battle line which is clearly drawn and has to do with even removing heads of state. But rest assured that when the Shah is down with Trujillo and that's the uh, French connection, that they will regroup themselves, that gang that are linked with Interpol and so forth and are competing with the Middle East connection, there will be a narcotics battle at all levels and piracy at the sea. And I think that putting the Shah down with Torrijos is a really good place for him with his drug connections, and they can make their own drug wars while we sit back and watch. Of course, the drug wars affect all of us. It affects the people on the, sleep, on the street, their inability to reason. It's like the opium wars in China that made people slaves. We become slaves, our young people, our best minds, and we get... Um, burglaries and muggings and murders and the pain of the narcotics traffic is felt in every city in America. You can see it on people's faces and everywhere. And uh, there's no conscience about importing narcotics throughout the world and doping people so that they're unable to think, unable to defend themselves and be non-productive in work programs. Somebody should surely come out with uh, better articles now on Jimmy Carter and Mr. Peter, Dr. Peter Byrne and the uh, Capricorn records and the drug traffic coming out of Georgia, the state that he was the governor, and the drug connections that got him to become president in the first place, starting with the Allman Brothers and the concerts and the drug uh, traffic in the South. <laughs> Good evening. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California. 
It's tape number 420, side B, December 21st, 1979. Leave your troubles outside. So, life is disappointing. Forget it. In here, life is beautiful. I want to speak to you for a minute or two on keeping the bibliographies of the tapes and the sheets that accompany these tapes. Many of you have heard the radio programs that I've done this, you know, going the eighth year. But since March of 77, there has been a sheet, a bibliography that has accompanied each tape cassette. I uh, have a hole puncher. You can cut them with a scissors and keep a three-hole notebook. And I put these sheets in order each week, you know, in the chronological order of the dates. And then I make other copies of them and break them into subjects such as the John Kennedy assassination, Jonestown, the disappearance of a CIA national security agent Paisley, the Nazi connections, the Rockefeller connections, and uh, I break them into subject major subject matters that I try to cover continuously and keep updated on, and then I copy those sheets and put them also into subjects if I can. And that's a good way to look up various tapes that you want quickly if you have them broken down into subjects, and maybe someday we'll get somebody to help index the names and items that are discussed each week. Uh, those of you that have followed the Jonestown tapes for the past year know that I've done many tapes on the boys from, I call them the boys from Guyana. I believe that they were me medical experimentations continued by Joseph Mengele's and the CIA, the Nazi war criminal uh, who's living in South America. He's been in Brazil uh, quite a good time, many years in and out of Brazil, Mengele's, and also uh, traveling in Argentina and Chile. And I believe that those people killed down in Jonestown had to be killed because if they were allowed to come home, once they got down there, we'd find many of them in a state of medical experimentation. I did three or four tapes on uh, Colonial Dignitat, the comparison between the Nazi uh, place in Chile where the top Nazis are torturing and experimenting and sending out assassination teams, Operation Condor, the expose recently briefly written up by Jack Anderson and the comparisons to Jonestown where innocent people are mind controlled and forced to sign confession slips of political assassinations. And I could see a link in the tapes I did on Colonial Dignitad of Chile to Brazil to Guyana and to West Germany. Well, last week, just this last week of the Associated Press story, last Saturday, December the 15th, a story broke of uh, Simon Wiesenthal, the man who keeps searching for Nazi war criminals, who said that Mengele's is located right now at Dignidad Colony, a ranching community established by German immigrants after World War II, situated 180 miles south of San Diego. So Wiesenthal is uh, now trying to get, he's been trying to get Mengele's extradited. He was living in Paraguay and Brazil, but it's interesting that the time that Jack Anderson's story breaks and that I've been pushing um, to expose people to the Colonia Dignitat and the assassination teams, that now uh, Wiesenthal is pinpointing that Mengele's, slippery Mengele's, is at least down at Colonia Dignitat at this time. Of course, he just takes his two little feet and walks across the border, and he's in Argentina, and he's protected. Joseph Mengele was one of the most notorious of persons because he was a doctor, physician at Auschwitz who did these experimentations. He lived openly in Germany and Bavaria. Nobody bothered him in, in the 1950s. And then quickly he had to get, in 1959 of August, extradition papers and went to Argentina and got protection of Perón in Argentina when they caught on that the Mengele's uh, farm equipment company run by his family also housed the notorious doctor from Auschwitz. Imagine him living in Bavaria until the late, until the middle 60s, actually, and then went down to Argentina. Uh, according to the Los Angeles Times article last year, he was seen a number of times in southern Brazil. There are 80,000 German nationals there, 2 million people of German descent, and he would return in the 60s. He went to his father's funeral in Germany, and he's been able to travel all over the world, And this Nazi, and one of his little nests is that colonial dignitad, and because he's notorious for medical experimentations, which I said were linked to colonial dignitad, and uh, referred to Jonestown as the boys from Guyana, it would be terribly important to get Mengele's and uh, make him surface now and see where 
uh, his experimentations are going. The book, The Boys from Brazil, and the movie that was taken from the book are about Joseph Mengele's. And again, if you saw the movie, the surroundings there of the private Air Force base, uh, not Air Force base, but for private planes to land, and the uh, on a river with boats going in and out, Mengele's headquarters uh, depicted in this movie were very similar to Jim Jones' headquarters in Guyana. There's a new book out called The Spider Web uh, by Joseph Persico, uh, Crown. It's $10. I haven't bought it yet. I just read a review. It's supposed to be the true story, although they use it as a novelette form. It's a code name, Odessa the Spider, of people, uh, Germans, the Fourth Reich, all over the world, and how they use the engraving of money to counterfeit money, of English money and uh, American money and German money during the process of World War II so that they could escape and start the Fourth Reich. If they lost that war, they would have the means to start and rebuild the Reich again. The story is about a Jewish man, Julius Goldhammer, who's an engraver, and in exchange for the Gestapo not killing his wife and child, he makes the plates for the counterfeit money, and then they go ahead and kill his family anyway. And this is the story of an investigation of Dachau and Auschwitz and how the German government preferred 60 million Nazis out on the streets, uh, the crowds, rather than communists coming to their doorsteps. And this is about the engraving of counterfeit money. That's one of the items I brought up before that Khomeini was complaining about the plans to overthrow Iran again by the CIA and that the embassy had been offered or was in the business of getting counterfeit money that would break the banks of Iran and leave them bankrupt. And uh, uh, they caught the Americans in the process one more time again, which was typical of the Nazi way of financing their next emergence, which could take place all over the world. Mengele's was consumed with the study of twins, the experimentations of their bodies, cutting them up alive to see how they felt pain and different parts of their uh, anatomies and brains to compare the two. Speaking of Mengele's and twins, there's a long article in the Washington Post, December the 10th, 1979, on identical twins. And there is the Star of David on the page and a swastika, and it's about two brothers who were separated at the time of the war, and one became a Nazi, and the other is Jewish, and one exhorted Goebbels and worked for the Third Reich, and the other brother was able to leave and separated himself from the Nazis. And it's about a reunion, a photograph in the Washington Post of the two brothers getting together long after World War II and having diametrically opposite political opinions. I mentioned on the tape a few weeks ago about a Nazi war criminal, Reinhard Heydrich. He was the head of chief of Hitler's Nazi police, the head of the Secret Service, the intelligence arm of uh, Adolf Hitler's regime. He was president of Interpol. That was the Nazi police system from 1940 to 1942. And allegedly, Heydrich was assassinated, and then Mr. Kaltenbrunner took his place, head of Interpol. Kaltenbrunner later was hung at Nuremberg for war crimes in 1946. And it was in that newsletter, Double Eagle, by Mr. Golanovsky, that he claimed that Heydrich didn't die in 1942, that he came to the United States and uh, continued writing in the United States and setting up the network for the Fourth Reich. The counterfeit money was out, and they were setting up their network, that spider, the Odessa, all over the world. And there's a photograph. I received several photographs from a very good historian, a student, a listener of the tapes, who got her books together and sent me pictures. I have a book, The Rescue of the Romanoffs, by this guy, Richards, but it's a paperback book. And she got a hold of the hardbound book, and there's a picture of Mr. Heydrich or Guy Richards, if it is the same person. And then she got pictures from Galen Spy of the Century. I had those. And another book on Heydrich put out by Ballantyne. And while this one picture was taken much later in life, when you hold them together and you look at the eyes and the chin and the hairline and the eyebrows and the nose and the ears, you could almost believe or you could be ready to believe that the article in the newsletter, Double Eagle, is accurate, that this could easily be Guy Richards, could be this Heydrich that came to the United States in 1942. The similarities are so tremendous. Um, the biography of Richards at Yale or his education really means very little. I have two biographies of E. Howard Hunt, who worked for CIA counterintelligence 21 years, one who's who in American authors and just another one in who's who. 
and the rearrangement of the families and the education in the years are all uh, shuffled around, and they're speaking about the same person with uh, different names and different education and military service and so forth. So we know the intelligence community makes up these dummy biographies, but these photographs of uh, Guy Richards and Heydrich are just tremendously similar, and I really appreciate the effort that was made. Uh, some of you are just wonderful in sending books, articles, and magazines and filling in pieces of information I never had and never have time to accumulate myself. There's so much here. So there is this interesting appearance, and maybe in time we'll find out among those corpses that didn't really die, those people that survived, although the media said they died, we may be able to add the name of Heydrich and realize that that was Richards who'd come to the United States. I don't want to leave the end of this year and my next to last tape of 1979 thinking that everything was all bad. Heavens forbid, I tried to think of some of the good things that happened this year, and uh, um, there weren't many, but there were some, and if you add them all up, maybe there was there was as much good news as bad. I don't know. There was a long article, Associated Press Story, um, December 16th, 1979. It wasn't a very good year for 12 mighty rulers. It goes into the crimes and murders of Pol Pot and the responsibility for millions of deaths under his regime the Shah of Iran, who was removed, and the deaths and torture under his regime, Eric Gehry of Granada, who uh, was charged with murder and fraud, and while he was visiting New York, was ousted, Idi Amin, who was notorious for killing allegedly over 200,000 people during his eight-year rule. In June, a junior Air Force officer in uh, Ghana overthrew the military regime of Akufo, and who was executed June 26, and of course there was Samosa, who ripped off all the millions of dollars left in his country and uh, was responsible for killing between 20 and 40,000 of the Sandinista. He's down in Paraguay with the Nazi war criminals, uh, meeting with Mengele's and Borman and all the others, I suppose. Somoza still living in luxury, servant swimming pool, and so forth. But I don't think even uh, being exiled in the mansion where Juan Perón was, that he's as comfortable as he would like to be. August the 8th, Mr. Gioga, I don't know if I pronounced that right. He had a decade of terror in Equatorial Guiana and killed tens of thousands of people, most of the intellectuals. He was executed by September the 29th. In September 14th in Afghanistan, President Nur Mohammed Taraki uh, was killed in, in a bloody Muslim rebellion there, fatally wounded in a palace shootout. September the 21st, Bokassa, the Central African Republic, with close links to the French government and bringing down the French government, recently in a scandal, uh, was removed from office. Bocassa uh, implemented, in quotes, medieval punishments, cut off ears, club criminals, slaughtered a hundred children who protested wearing school uniforms. He's down the Ivory Coast. They won't extradite him. He's been charged with mass murder and cannibalism. And October 15th, Carlos Ubera Romero, president of El Salvador, was overthrown. There's still a bloody battle going on. 35 of the leftists were killed this week. There's a lot of agitation, but at least the president of El Salvador was out. And, of course, October 26th in South Korea, President Park Chung-hee uh, was killed. Seven people are being charged with his murder. But the CIA and the government that we put into power along with them uh, also killed him, and now they're being charged for murder. And in Bolivia, the government changed hands November 1st. And I haven't had a chance to talk about the Bolivian government. There's a woman who's the president of Bolivia now, and I do want to go into that in time eventually on the tapes, because most of the Latin American countries, like the Muslim countries, are very sexist, and the Catholic Church, and the place of the woman, is not very high up in the scale of uh, action or control in the political scene. But there's a woman now as the president of um, Bolivia, and it seems to be working out so far. <laughs> this was quite a year, if you think of it. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller is out of commission and murdered by a team that's dead silent and uh, uh, slipped away very quietly. It just They offed him. Uh, Parks out of Korea and uh, Samoza out of Nicaragua and Bolivia changing hands. Iran with the Shah out. Those are amazing changes. I mean, if you just mark off the calendar, uh, put a date there and choose your dictator and hope that he falls off. That might be a good way to start 1980. A little victory out in California at the time of People's Park. Maybe you don't remember those days, May 16, 1969. Ten years ago, there was a vacant lot, three acres of Kitty's Playground, 
and a person, James Rector, who was watching, riding from the rooftop, was killed by the sheriff, a shotgun blast. The people had built a place for their children, the flower people, the children uh, growing up on the streets who left home and left somewhat the corporate structure and were trying to do their own thing. Uh, just this last November, there was the breaking of axes on the cement that's the area that Joni Mitchell wrote a song about. They paved paradise and put in a parking lot. Well, this November, the axes were breaking up the cement, and the men on the street were interviewing, and what are you doing? We're putting a garden back in the People's Park. The University of California is reducing their parking lot again to a People's Park. The pressure of the 10 years was so great that paradise is is reversible and that's the important thing it, it really is important if people work or believe in something and work for it the parking lot didn't stay and flowers will soon grow and people will be tearing out the cement and pavement and children will be playing in a place where a man was shot down at the time of riots because the people believed in this so much and paraded and it's very important that is a victory it's a small victory but as a victory, uh, the David versus Goliath, again, the people versus the University of California and the pressure. Uh, Ford Motor Company losing $1 billion in U.S. operations this year. I just read yesterday Memorex is going broke. What else was good this year? Well, Jack Anderson came out with some interesting articles, and they're trial balloons, too. And when he writes them, they always surface two or three years later, and he was into subjects that I've worked on for so many years and they were important. He talked about Operation Condor and Colonial Dignitat and the Chilean assassination teams that go all over the world that are linked to World War II and the Nazis. He did a long article on Project Paperclip and the Nazi war criminals and how they were brought to this United States and weren't cleared out. He did one on Richard Nixon and his office and Nikolai Malaksa and the Iron Guard. And those are important. They're very important because I work so hard on these subjects, and to get them into the establishment news media is a victory of sorts. It isn't the solution or the answer, but it means that the ground is cracked and pieces of the puzzle are surfacing, and you can't underestimate the pressure and the power of Jack Anderson and his syndicated column. Uh, there's a trial to exhume Lee Harvey Oswald. I've been claiming for years that he's not in that grave. They may turn down the suit in Texas. They've already turned down some of the legal challenges there. I doubt if the government could stand to open it, but at least it's being tried in a court of law. Uh, there's talk of exhuming um, Howard Hughes' body. Not much talk legally. Doug Wallace, the attorney, filed a suit a while back. I did tapes on that on the radio, but at least Jim Bacon and Brooks Randall and other syndicated columnists and a double of Oswald are saying that Vance Cooper is buried in that grave and it's not... Howard. These are little things, but for me, to see them in the major newspaper, whether it's the wire services or the San Francisco Examiner, or to be in contact with the people who are doing the pushing and shoving, trying to get a little light into a long era of death and tombs is invigorating or refreshing. And of course, there's new articles about Richard Nixon and his payoffs and his links to Jimmy Hoffa and organized crime and assassination teams down there. Just a little bit of that inkling out. So there is um, a way that some of this news is surfacing and we have to follow it. And of course there's good news for Galileo. That was in the newspaper this week. The Pope has asked the Vatican to clear Galileo. He was convicted as a heretic in 1633 so we're very grateful to Pope John Paul II of Krakow who wants to clear Galileo. He's carrying on his Inquisition court and I mentioned last week the outrageous uh, trial of the most liberal of the Catholic priests and he, trying to keep them from teaching. One of them uh, just went against his orders and was teaching again this week. Bravo. People are catching on. Thank God, instead of going into a hole and groveling and flagellating, the priest just got up and preached anyway. And that's all you have to do is to ignore these thieves and these assassins and these liars and do your own thing and turn more people onto the truth so that when they're put against the wall, they say, I won't believe you. I won't go. I won't fight. I won't buy your tickets. I don't believe what you're saying. You're a bunch of liars. And uh, study world events and keep up with them. And like the priest that refused to take the orders from the Pope this week, knuckle under the pressure and you'll find that more people are on your side than if you just give in and grovel and take orders from 
other people that are dangerous and stupid. I found some more good news this year. The last of the Wilmington 10 were paroled. Do you remember that case in North Carolina where Richard Nixon and Robert Martin and the Justice Department tried to get nine black men and one white woman convicted in 1972? They said they firebombed a grocery store during a racial riot, and they were all framed. This was part of the COINTEL program of the government. Well, the very last one of those uh, Wilmington 10 has been paroled. They sneaked the others out very quietly. One is a divinity student at Duke University studying to be a minister, and he was just released. And there was one other piece of good news. This last year, it just came recently, the Indians uh, were awarded $52 million for land they lost in 1905. This is the northern uh, Dakota, North Dakota border of Canadian uh, boundaries. They haven't been paid yet. They may be all murdered or poisoned before they ever get the $52 million. I don't know if the check is written out or if it's in their hands, but they've been told that they could get this money, and this was a land treaty, and they're supposed to be awarded $52 million. So the Wilmington 10 are out, and some American Indians finally got a payback for the ripoff. So 1979 wasn't all bad, was it? It always stands to reason that the people that are doing the most work and are the closest to stepping on toes usually suffer the hardest. Uh, I don't know how many of you are following the sentences of the Scientologists. They've been accused of conspiring to break into government offices and obstruct justice. The Scientologists are the only group. I'm not arguing with the good or the bad or anything about them as a religion or an organization, but they are the only group that consistently fight to get the FBI blackmailing off our back, to show the conspiracies of the Internal Revenue, to show the links of the Nazis, of Interpol, of drug traffic. They're consistent. Their research is good. They get government documents. And I'm going to give you again to start 1980 the information on subscribing to freedom. I take three papers. It's $5 a year. I cut out an article on one side and one on the other to follow them, and I keep one whole. Their papers are filled with information. If you have $5, order one copy of everything they printed last year, and you'll have excellent research. They're doing the best work, and they're the most dedicated to having our minds free and our bodies not polluted with poisons. And, of course, it's natural that they, many of them had to go to jail for trying to get these documents and to, for infiltrating these agencies. But they've done a fantastic job, and if you can find $5 anywhere, support them and get the paper. And if some of you have some extra money, get subscriptions for friends and get copies, 10 copies a year of Freedom, because I don't have to spend all the time on the tapes then just repeating what they're printing. And there isn't a sentence hardly that's wasted. Uh, what they're writing about is the way the government controls us, closes in on us, the police state, mentality, and it's done through documents they've gotten from the government's own hands to prove uh, just what they are doing to us in terms of air control, medicine, street, uh, medical experimentations, and so forth. Um, it's a very sad year that some of these Scientologists are going to prison. Uh, six were sentenced before, and now there's four more, and they are the most dedicated to getting uh, the information out of any group that I can think of in my years of research, consistently good work that's very valuable. I keep promising that in 1980 I will do some tapes on the National Labor Caucus. Some of my uh, subscribers and my close personal friends believe in the National Labor Caucus, and uh, I want to do an analysis of their book, Dope, and also their work. One of my objections to the Labor Caucus is they single certain names, and they have this linear view, and they close in, say, on Margaret Mead or her husband, Mr. Bateson, or they blame. Recently, I got some articles that were sent to me from Solidarity in which they blame Kim Philby for the breaking up of Iran and that he works with British intelligence. Uh, they attack Ralph Nader and always going after Kim Philby. And there's no supporting evidence of the Philby involvement or the Philby still isn't a Russian agent. And one of my objections is the simplistic taking of names. They have about 30 names, and they use them over and over and over again and exclude a broad area that if you talk to them personally, they avoid, they never talk about, they never reveal, and they stay on one line and uh, do not make the interconnecting links, and they have scapegoats. And I, I think that uh, 
the Scientologists get documents from the government and hand them on to us so we can come to our own conclusion about which doctors and which names are used. And the Labor Caucus goes off on a branch and uh, takes a route which I don't approve of very often and avoids areas that I know are not mentioned and which are important. Now, one of the best guidelines I have to the Labor Caucus is that I feel um, not mo there's no time for modesty, that my work on the Kennedy assassination is maybe the most complete of any single person in the United States. I've read every book on the Kennedy assassination, uh, over 200 books, every article, uh, delved into National Archives documents and kept files of information, just working on that for years, eight years before I published a single article. So I feel that when names involve, say, in the Kennedy assassination, the conspiracies to kill the president uh, or the senator or to frame Ted Kennedy at Chappaquiddick or to kill Martin Luther King, I know the operators, I know their names, I know the chain of command where the assassination teams come from, and I keep working on it. So as a guideline, if I take what the Labor Caucus says and compare it to what I know, when they write about the Kennedy assassination, and compare it to what I know, I know where they're way off base. And we'll do, we'll do a lot more of that in 1980. I'll go into it. But when I work with a Scientologist, um, whatever they print in freedom can't be challenged because it's documents that they're using. And they're not blaming or fingering, and you can come to your own conclusions a lot of the time, but they're actually using government documents. And that's the best way to come to conclusions is don't let somebody select your heroes or your villains for you, but read the material and form your own conclusions. Last week I talked about microwave ovens and the danger that Jodrell Bank was having in England with the astronomers and the radio waves because of the leaks in the um, ovens, the microwave ovens, and I got a letter, it's dated December, November rather, 1979, from another researcher who uh, has been keeping up with radiation and mind control and medical experiments, and he received information um, that we should look into that reminds me of the radiation I talked about last week. This letter that was sent to this friend said, at West Ever, West Ever Air Force Base in Chippy, Massachusetts, they are using unwilling subjects, some unknowing, and children in top-secret microwave uh, medical, scientific, and psychological experiments. The first tests have murdered are dosing people and children with known cancer and other disease-causing microwave radiation for years, causing unidentifiable cancer, in quotes. Unidentifiable was reported by Army Medical Group at Columbia University and many others. They intentionally interfered with the treatment so the subjects would die. They destroy lives and health. They are torturing, ruining, hurting lives and the health and minds of children. They are degraded, dehumanized, sexually abused, and more. The tests are depriving decent citizens of all their rights of lives, health, freedom, dignity, and privacy. These tests have murdered and are killing citizens with secret microwave technology that is over 20 years old. This letter was mailed November 1979 to research in Pennsylvania, and the postmark came from Springfield, Massachusetts. I repeat, they claim it's coming from Westever Air Force Base, Chippy, Massachusetts, is where the experiments are going on. We can close 1979 with one little news item out of the L.A. Times. 300 Indochinese refugees are going to join the California National Guard, according to Major General Frank J. Schober, Jr., the commander. The enlistees will be sworn in at Los Alamitos Reserve Training. Uh, they will pay the same benefits as other enlistees with no previous service, $419 a month. I wonder if any of those were part of the deadly CIA Operation Phoenix program that we're putting uh, Indo-Chinese or Vietnamese refugees into the California National Guard. That's a pretty heavy thought to leave you on. But our tape is over. Have a really good year, as I say. Stay healthy and happy and inquisitive. Read a lot. Write a lot to people. Share the information and speak up, because if ever there was a chance to do it, it's now, and it's later than we think, and there isn't going to be that much chance. If you get into a wartime situation, then for national security, we become silenced. So now's the time to shout. If you don't like it, shout. Have a good year. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California. I'll be with you next week. Wie geht's? Comment ça va? Feel, feel good. Ich bin euer Confrancier. Je suis votre compère. 
Velkommen hjem, 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 Velkommen hjem,